Uh, du Bois felt that their father, Henry, uh, Papa was not aggressive enough by Dr. Du Bois' standards. And in fact, uh, Dr. Du Bois considered that he thought my father was a handkerchief head kind of Negro, the bowing and stooping kind. And so therefore he chose to live with her or stay with her brother. And so we can infer from that sort of choosing to stay with the brother that uh, Dr. Du Bois felt that the younger Delaney had a dignified social position. So uh, in the first photograph, uh, basically we see the original entryway into Chavis Park. Uh, for those who are local, obviously you know about Chavis Park here in Raleigh. The outside of the city would eventually become the inside of the city. So back in the day in 1939, nobody wanted to live in this area. It was the outposts. And now essentially what we see through gentrification is folks want to get back downtown. So a little bit about the actual photograph itself. Uh, a use of a wide angle lens. The photographer is motivated to capture context and social vibrancy of, of the park. CPO quality lends a sense of nostalgia and less than perfect production framing a sense of authenticity. Subjects to appear unaware of the camera, the photographer. The carousel is unenclosed, only protected by a canvas tent and appears to be the park's main attraction. The facility to the left likely includes a restroom. It appears to be a sunny day, possibly sunny, as Sunday attire is being worn. A uh, cause of a good variety, uh, possibly indicating the commingling of various social economic classes. Dirt roads, pedestrian cars likely share some infrastructure with sidewalk only at the building types. An interiority or inside quality of the park is shown. What the story excludes functions in interpretive lands, there is no city skyscrapers at this time. The backdrop to the park as has emerged today. Delany probably could not have imagined outside of the city would in effect become the inside. So on to the next one. Uh, so I spoke earlier about uh, Dr. Danello uh, Delany having a dignified photographic eye. So the subjects, all male in this instance, are intimately constructed when compared to figure one of the images I just shown. Uh, we can possibly discern individual identities. Subjects appear to be part of a swim team as similarly adorned. Each, if they are not aware of, even if they are not aware of the camera, subjects are in effect on stage uh, via the diving board, aware that they are being watched. They are statuesque or regal in posture. The photo is of good technical quality, sepia quality lending a sense of nostalgia, and less than perfect production framing, a sense of authenticity as well. And so what the story excludes, within the shadow of local history and places as generalized, there are identities and circumstances which still merit greater attention. The subjects are unnamed or unknown in terms of the demarcation on the photograph itself, but often because of the loss of these archives, we don't know the individuals. We happen to know many of them, however, in this case. Also, just kind of elephant in the room, you can see back, even as far back then, there was a vibrant social swimming community amongst African Americans. Uh, as part of uh, James Autry's uh, collection uh, given to Spurn and Ford use, uh, as part of that, uh, the four images featured have been more formally named the James Autry Chavis uh, Park Historical Photo Collection memorializing his contribution. Archer granted exclusive permission of use to Sperner with some mistrust of their commodification. And so I am inferring that he's given to this community organization with the idea of, or the awareness that they will be commodified by others. But he's probably not anticipating that through digital circulation that it will be sort of like unleashing Pandora's box that once out in this sort of digital milieu that he would not be able to control it, nor would they as it turns out. But in uh, any event, we are aware that through Archer's work that he's very aware that he's telling a story. And so it's very interesting the, the war theme that came up in the presentation just before me. Um, Chavis Park has a kind of residual wartime aesthetic. And so you can sort of see these. This is uh, 
an airplane slide. It's not a real airplane at all, but the kind of urban uh, mythology around this image and the idea of the wartime. So in this context, um, it is well known that Chavis Park and the surrounding area served as a World War II um, military barracks of, of the time. And so children appear to be in fall or winter attire, uh, signaling the park's expansive use for mostly a summertime activity. The trees have no leaves to indicate that. Gender appears about equal but notably split, meeting in the middle. I thought I heard a like, click. That's my time up. But. <laughs> Ages of children appear to be about 8 to 12 years old. Uh, the photo is of good technical quality. The photos have a good tonal range. Uh, the story excludes uh, there is a strong military residual aesthetic in the park. Negro troops being barracked near the park just before World War II. The airplane slide itself was installed after the Korean War, so 1950, not World War II. Its mere existence of some debate with city officials prior to the emergence of these photos in 2008. So everybody who was around then, they know that this was there, but 40, 50 years later, the city said, nope, we never had one, um, so on and so forth. And so someone emerges, his daughter, and says, yes, we did. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop on that particular image. Um, this <coughs> one, um, uh, is the, um, let's see, that's my first little bit here. This is the kitty train, and so what the story includes is uh, there are mostly male children riders with one girl and maybe a mother visible at row six from the left. The train adult conductor uh, creates a strong directional vector leading to two older kids approaching the train from the right. Their friend right side appears to be engaging the camera, uh, aware of the photographer's presence. The photo is good, of good technical quality with production framing is suggestive of some expertise. The photos have good tone of range, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, his real profession, uh, how he made a living, was with the postal service, not as a professional photographer. So you have to consider in the time that that ability to construct the photo and the technical capacity was kind of unusual for uh, photography in the era. Um, my final image, um, I entitled, the title I gave it years later, uh, is Boy on the Move, what the story includes. The photo is less technically perfect, it's a little blurry, but we can see the infamous carousel house is now being enclosed. And so uh, you see that sort of transition or kind of movement from that original 1939 image I just shared with you. Uh, while the photograph is less technically perfect, it has a lyrical and poetic dimension. The photo requires more of the viewer, but it's, open, it's an open text as a result, allowing us to read into it. And so my boy on the move, naming it, and what you might be thinking of it now is what I'm calling that open text that allows us to infer into it in an interesting way. Um, so to move it along, uh, why are these things important now? I'm basically saying, as the progress in social mobility and narrative continues to unfold at Chavis Park today, and around Chavis, a rhetorical understanding of these photographs is useful, um, and I would argue lend even more authority to their potential relevancy as historical record made contemporarily relevant. Uh, there is a critical need for context and understanding in urban redevelopment interests, and part of my personal research investigation was to sort of reclaim some of this photograph to put it back into circulation. So we're essentially going from a private collection, like they didn't even think it existed, and I created a project uh, to kind of map out these and created a mapping series to document that particular uh, activity at Chavis Park and the surrounding areas. And so I want to thank uh, the South Park East Raleigh Neighborhood <coughs> Association for their contribution and my allowance, uh, allowing me to work with them and have access to them. Um, and so you can see yet again, uh, that one image from 1950 is now circulating back into contemporary um, paraphernalia, et cetera, et cetera.
afternoon. Uh, my name is Virginia Cumberbatch. Um, I serve as the director of the Community Engagement Center and Social Justice Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and my role um, is sort of twofold. One, within the division, um, our job is to recalibrate how we discuss inclusion and diversity at a student level and a faculty level. Um, but the work that I do is really around um, making us less of an ivory tower and more of a community anchor. And what does it mean to truly be engaged in our community? Um, and part of the work that I'm privileged to do um, is take part in shaping how we value inclusiveness and equity as more than a check mark, but a fundamental value shift. Historically, our institution and our institutional infrastructures have worked to silo particular experiences, voices, and identities, failing to truly integrate and intersect the values of all. And so the As We Saw It project um, is something uh, that I started off um, when I was in grad school um, at the LBJ School of Public Policy. Um, and we could really argue that this happens, you know, as a 60 years in the making project. But something that really started about four years ago, when we realized that um, these stories were literally dying off. And if we weren't going to capture it now, uh, we would lose sight of the contributions uh, that these, what we call precursors, which are black alumni that were a part of the university anywhere between 1950, the beginning of integration,